Worlds this year. This is the first uh, sprint weekend. Andrea Rizzoli it is with Zayed Ashkanani and Klaus Battler leading the championship on the points scored from Monza. Now, bear in mind that not everybody does both the endurance and the sprint rounds. So Rizzoli, Ashkanani and Battler are missing. So is Dennis Lynn. But Caldarelli is here. Mapelli is here. Berman is not, but Mario Engel and Luca Stolt are. Timor Bogoslavski, Nico Bastian are, but Felipe Fraga, for example, is not. So uh, in terms of the overall uh, points coming end of the weekend, it's going to look rather different. Uh, but of course, we'll also have the two race results giving points for the Blockpan GT World Challenge Europe based on the two sprint races of the weekend. Uh, the reason for the delay is that there are some errant Porsches from the Porsche Club of Great Britain series just being retrieved. Uh, and as soon as the road is clear, then Alain Adon, the race director, can give the instruction and everybody queued up at the end of the pit lane will be released. We are 20 seconds away from the session starting and very soon, therefore, we will be in business. There you can see the field, most of which are queued up at the end of the pit lane. Uh, 26 cars we have, 25 managed to get a time out of the first session. Uh, the one car that didn't do a lap time being the Santa Lock Audi number 25, and that is the car of Simon Gachet and Christopher Husser. Uh, it was a clutch problem, a brand new clutch put in the car after Monza, but there was a leak and the fluid from the clutch was getting onto pads and therefore making them undrivable, so they've had to change the clutch. The Audi Sport engineer I spoke to said, um, It'll all be fine for FP2, so fingers crossed they will be on track uh, and getting the mileage in that they have missed after that first hour. Well, they missed the first hour, and that's time lost. You can never make it up, and particularly, I mean, we've had a message, all cars must have lights on. Has that message not gotten through to some of the teams in the pit lane? Track was looking like it could go not entirely wet, but maybe this, that slicky situation which is most unpleasant because it's neither wet tyres nor dry tyres. Everybody will be praying that the track goes either one way or the other and not this sort of no man's land or whether you're never quite sure whether it's going to be wet when you go out or dry when you come back in. So far, track looks reasonable, but you get little spots of rain or sleet or hail or all three on the camera lens just coming through Hawthorns. So this outlap an opportunity for the drivers to assess what the road is like and in most cases I think you've got the higher graded driver the pro drivers going out to do the mileage at the start of this session get the times in and then perhaps having done that you can let the am drive around for the rest of the session and get the mileage in get the feel for the car but it's still looking a bit black, a bit black over Bill's mothers as they say it is uh, looking very unpleasant now that's the view probably looking more or less due south as the cars come along start finish straight to go onto their first flying lap but it's the north and northeast that looks dire. And is that a, I just one of those recovery vehicles that was just behind them, tire bales? Anyway, Lucas Stoltz, and or not Lucas Stoltz, but in number, it is Mario Engel, in fact, yeah. in the Black Falcon Mercedes. Everybody will want to do as much as they can as quickly as possible in the event that what looks very looming actually does deposit significant amount of rain on the brand's hatch circuit. So there, Mauro Engel, who will go for the target time, but the absolute best in Sector 1, done by Christopher Meese. Sector 1 taking you uh, effectively for the Indy circuit, that stop from Cooper Strait. And uh, Mauro Engel then now comes down towards the right-hander of Hawthorns, up towards Westfield, where early on in FP1 we were looking at just how bumpy it was through there. The Audis in particular seem to be bouncing all over the place. And again, you see the bumps as the Mercedes goes through. Tell you, far more prominent in these sorts of cars than in the British Touring cars, one of the other categories that runs on the Grand Prix circuit, as an example. The Grand Prix circuit doesn't get used that often. It is used these days for the DTM, and that curve on the outside of Stirlings was flattened in advance of the DTM last year. OK, it looked different to when we were here one year ago. So time, the boogie time, the time that was set this morning by Matt Rapp, Raffaele Marcello and the 88 Mercedes, 123.310. That's the time that everybody will be focusing upon, so let's see what happens. Barrow Engel first across the line, first to record the time, 126. In fact, we've beaten by Christopher Meese already, 125.1. So time's roughly just under two seconds away from those that were achieved earlier in the morning. And you can't say it's because it's got hotter, because it's got a, a very chill, blustery wind here at Brands Hack. When the sun comes out, it looks all fine, but it's pretty blustery. Yes, yeah, it's very wide at Grand Hill Bend. Well, that's Barrow Angle likewise, just yeah. struggling for a little bit of bite coming through. So if uh, there is that just a little film, that thin, almost invisible film of moisture on the track surface, particularly in summer like 
Graham Hill fan, you do tend to get dragged out all the way to the outside of the corner. Christopher Meese right now of the lead cars that we're looking at is the one that is on the pace. But Mercury Portolotti in the 63 Lamborghini, likewise on an outlap, fastest second sector of anybody. Not hanging around. There's this fascination this year of, of course, two very evenly matched rival Lamborghini teams, GRT Grasso Racing Team, which has been the smiled upon, if not factory squad, for a number of seasons with great results, winning the Endurance Championship in 17, as you see Meese there with two absolute best twitching out of Sterling. But now on the scene has come the Orange One FFF Racing Team, and this real head-to-head -head grudge match between the two Lamborghini teams is another subplot to this year's championship. Now, what about Christopher Meese on this lap? Two absolute best. He should go quickest of all, breaks the beam, goes fastest on a 124.624. Christopher Meese on the top of the times. He struggled a little bit coming out of Sterling's. He was really, really hard on the throttle early on the edge of the corner. Christopher Meese, outstanding in an Audi, kept it all neat and tidy, but maybe the grip levels still nowhere at the level that we saw what, just two hours ago. Last lap, 124.5. In fact, it's, it's Campbell in the 17, so where am I? Yeah, in the Audi. Yeah. And you just see number 90 Mercedes in the pit lane going nowhere. Timor Bogomzlavski and Fabian Schiller's car. There's no work being done on it. He's just sat there. So what thickens is what's going on for that. It's on the apron, so you get the feeling it should be out there. But there's no work going on. Now, Marvin Kirchhofer is at the wheel of number 76, Aston Martin, the Art Motorsport car. And the best time that he has done is a 125.350. He's done a personal best in the first sector, bouncing through Westfield. Road plunges downhill on another climb through Dingle Dale up towards Sheen Curve. Mirko Bortolotti goes top, 1 minute 24.353. Tom Gamble, new to GT racing, goes second, 124.501. And Christopher Meese is down to third ahead of Vinglock and then Simon Gachet fifth. Marrow Engel looking like this could be a lap that will put him overall fastest, quickest in sector one, personal best, sector two. Mirko Bortolotti, 124.3. As we look again at Kerkhofer winning for that, where is that time we're looking at? Uh, so only goes up fourth place, slightly yeah. disappointing. Uh, there is what you do when you run wide, coming out of Paddingle Bend. Frank Stippler, you should know better. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often. Frank Stippler wide at Paddingle Bend, back on 16. Unfortunately it happens when we've got the camera on him. Yeah, exactly. There the Santalot team looking on. As I say, Simon Gachet that missed uh, FP1 is on track and already doing a pretty decent job within the top 10. But we've got this question mark uh, over the Mercedes that's now making its way down the pit lane. And we've just had very, very wide at Grand Hill Bend. Taylor Proto, the American-based British board driver, go very, very wide indeed. So it's all happening in this second session. What's going on at the moment? This is Simon Gachet that we were talking about earlier. So they're an hour behind in terms of lost track time. Another brand new clutch put into the car though now. Well, unfortunately, the new clutch wasn't the problem. It was the oil leak that, le or the fluid leak that leaked into the clutch plates, and uh, that's what caused the problem. So they had to fix the clutch by replacing it, but principally fix the leak, the hydraulic leak that caused the problem in the first place. So it's a cause and effect, but that's all been rectified. But there's a lot of work around the back of a GT car. Wow, look at that! Now there in the that's regular. Pit by the change. Mark Finkelhock, I think, giving away. Yep. Simon Gachet then up towards the timing line. Got two personal bests, meant that three, and a 124.705 puts him up to sixth fastest. Dries Van Thor, in the meantime, has got second pickers in his ID, and he is 60 thousandths of a second. Marcus Finkelhock, Marcus, wow! That's what happens when you get oversteer. The car turns into the direction you don't want to be going by flattening out the curb on Sterling's. Clearly, clearly is saving a lot of drivers, not only embarrassment, but a lot of money, and, mm. but almost possible. You're bit, giving yourself a bit of a rattle around the, uh, the cockpit. So French driver Stephen Pallet will take over that car. Andrea Bertolini here in the Pro-Am class Ferrari that he shares with Louis Machiels, and this is a lap around Brown's Hatch. So a lot of Graham Hill Bend, long Cooper Street, on the brakes, interesting the way he takes sort of a nally ish entry into Surtees, then that's the car flowed out to the curb on the outside, then all the way through the gears, fourth, fifth, sixth gear. You always look at that, the bridge is about 12 feet high, but you think you're going to hit it, then down the drop, then into this wonderful, wonderful Hawthorne's bend, 
quicker than it looks because it's uphill and it's got sight banking in your favour. Short straight down to Westfield, bumpy, bumpy, bumpy. Watch the exit, the curb can catch you out then again. The plunge down into Dingle Dell. Then looking skyward, looking at the trees. Pick out your tree, that's where you want to turn. Turn, make your apex and sheen curve. Then the short little sprint up into Sterling's with the much, much more considered and, and let's say, well, helpful curve on the outside. Then again, a short run down into Clark Curve. Let the car float all the way out to the gravel on the outside. The natural trajectory brings it back and makes it a two apex corner. There you are, back start, finish straight. And that lap, a 126.217 for Andrea Bertolini, 19th fastest in the Ferrari. Dries Van Four has now eclipsed Purple Portalotti, fastest first sector, 124.236. Still timed just under, just under a second away from those that we saw some two hours ago. And that was set relatively early by Marcello Raffaele in the Mercedes 88, number 88. And we've yet to see a time, and we've got a time from that. We have Vincent Aprile is currently in 10th place on our 24.9. So now the track conditions are not as favorable as they were earlier this morning, which is difficult to believe, or everybody's running on tires that have done a significant amount of mileage from that FP1 session. They may wait and see what conditions are going to be. Would they risk running a set of new tires to get an eyeball on what they would expect when they come to get into their two qualifying segments, but they're not until four, four o'clock. Finishes at, well, quarter to five in the evening, so temperatures are going to be way different from where we are now. What the weather's going to do, the cloud, the rain, the snow, the hail, well, no need for the gods to tell us that one. So get the mileage in early, just in case this turns out to be a, a, a wet end to the session. Qualifying coming up at the end of the day. Looking at Jean-Luc Bobelic, they 25th of the 26. He's another within the... Uh, Pro-Am Cup. There's only one Am Cup entrant, Florian Schultz of Wolfgang Triller's Ferrari. And there's a car that's stopped coming into the pit lane, so there's now traffic jam in the pits. But Bobolik goes over the line, and that lap time is 27.982. I think the weather is definitely turning worse because now it is properly raining. The wipers are on, and it's got a lot greyer, but there's rain in the air. Yeah, we're even seeing it here in the commentary position. We're some 1,000 feet above sea level in this uh, eerie and looking down, uh, so we're getting the effects of it, and unquestionably, well, you can see on the windscreen that it is sufficient to get drivers to have to respond. And Thomas Neubauer just runs around the outside, coming up into Sheen Curve, but at very much reduced pace, on slick tyres, not wanting to take an unnecessary risk, which is the sensible thing to do. Most are bailing, aren't they, coming into the pit lane because there's no point persevering. Even the fans have decided that they've got uh, a requirement to get the wet weather gear on. It's it's about to, it's going to be biblical. I mean, it looks horrendous to the north of the circuit. So Neubauer into the pit lane. That's what Brand Hatch has become, having taken a photograph early on in the day saying we've got much nicer weather here than at Monza. It's becoming Monza-esque now. It's probably grey and wet. It's going to get even gloomier, I fear. Well, I feel for the poor cameramen who are out pretty much all day. Now, they come like they're dressed as Sherpas because, believe me, wind chill factor and ambient temperature are not exactly stimulating. But they are out there doing their job and they will be there all day come whatever. Yeah. We've had the sunshine, we've got the wind, now we've got the rain, we've got the hail. Somebody's going to be brave and go out on the set of weather tyres at some point. And I think it's going to be the Audi of Finlay Hutchison and Fred Verviche, because that's just slithered its way out of the pit lane, and it's being driven by Fred Verviche. Well, I'm glad it's Fred doing it, yeah. At least he knows his way around a racetrack and certainly knows his way around Brands Hatch. And he's, in a sense, um, preempted my next question to you, which was, what would a team now do? Would it think, right, there's no point going out, we'll just sit and wait for it to improve, or do you need the wet weather running? You could do one or two things. You could have put on a set of wet weather tyres, but the actual amount of you know, rain that looks to be on the circuit is that bit between it's not wet enough and it's not dry enough. Alternatively, and maybe with someone like Frederick Beach, you could take the punt and send him out on a set of slicks to see how far can we go in these conditions before it becomes impossible, should this be what happens in qualifying. In other words, it's about grip over lack of grip. Sure. 76 is in, so Marvin Kirchhofer comes down the pit lane. 
in the R Motorsport, Aston Martin that he shares with Ricky Cullard, and another replay running wide, sparks coming out of Sterling's. Couldn't do that 12 months ago, could you? No. I mean, if you did that 12 months ago, you'd be turning sharp left and into the power of the wall on the left hand side. But the downside is there's a lot of earth getting kicked yeah. up onto the track, and that's not ideal by any stretch of the imagination. The intention of the curb was to avoid that very snappy reaction of a car, rotor curb, and drop the wheel down the other side. Now you're getting drivers using the curb and the bit beyond, and you know somebody will get caught out as the consequence of someone else's actions. So we wait to see. There are this, I was going to say, the, the wet weather tires. There is only one wet weather tire here in the Blancpain. No intermediate tire. Fred Verviche in the gravel at Clark Curve. He's coming into the pit lane, but I've just looked out of the window and seen a blue Audi way wide through the gravel. He's come back on the road straight into the pit lane, but that gives you an example of how wet it has been. Well, he obviously went out in slicks. Yeah. And that was the team would have sent him out, my view, maybe I'm wrong, to see, go out, do the lap, give us the information. Mm. So, again, same situation for... Christopher Mace. Yeah, Christopher Mace. Um, I'm assuming, and we don't know because we can't get a, a view of what the uh, WRT team chose to do with Christopher Mace. Would that, I mean, the pace he's going at, he looks like he is also on slicks, but he's creeping round yeah. Graham Hill Bend. And once he puts the power on, the thing snakes. Uh, Christopher Mace is your man to do this test. He's not staying on what I would consider to be the normal lines. He's running the, the long way around. And I would imagine that's a set of sticks as we watch the Black Falcon Mercedes again. But the rainfall is sufficient. This is going to be a one lap run, in my view, because what it's doing up at the top of the hill at Druids, where it's probably raining at its worst, around the back of the circuit, it doesn't look to be quite as treacherous. But downhill through Graham Hill Bend, it is rubbered up. It's a part of the racetrack that's always slippery, wet, dry, or anything in between. So the lap times are irrelevant. It's more interesting to see what the weather is going to do. It's actually got a bit brighter. So but we, we, we need to look to our left. That's yeah. where the weather is coming from. Looking to the sort of, I would say, the south or southeast, or south, south, south or southwest. There you've got blue sky. They have blue sky, and that's sort of bypassing the back of the circuit. Yeah. But anyway, there we, we are. Quandary for the teams. But yeah. at the moment, that's Fred Vavici's car back into the pit lane. So he was in the gravel. Back in, he's coming Christopher Meese. So he's had a look, he doesn't like it. But he didn't go off, that we know. The same as applied at Monza, the difficulty that you can run slicks in conditions. This is the limit. But as long as you've got ambient temperature and you've got track temperature. But where the ambient is low and the track's even lower, then it's very, very difficult indeed. And you know, you, you, on a circuit like Brands Hatch, there are lots of subtle little changes of angle, camber, whatever. And Lucas Stolzer, is it Lucas Stolzer and Marco Mappelli? Mauro Engel. Mauro, Mauro Engel, sorry. Saying, I'm in the Mercedes to do a complete lap. And also going out is another of the Mercedes, 89, the Acker car of Thomas Neubauer. Paddock looks very wet, other bits don't look quite so bad. Well, it's this part of the track that's been the beneficiary of what's been uh, dropped on the circuit, mostly. So probably from Surtees all the way through the remaining part of the Grand Prix loop are reasonably drivable, but it's just down here again, you can see just how slippery, and it's the curbing now that the rain has fallen on it, that is even more slippery than the, the, the actual tarmac itself. So this is Engel's view. He's had one lap, so he's had a look. Bit more confidence to push on on this section perhaps now. Yeah, you can see the track, you can see the lighter shades of the tarmac. Here it's relatively unaffected by the rain. Mm. So all the way down and into Hawthorns, and he's sort of tippy-toeing it all the way through. Very gentle inputs in the steering wheel, gentle inputs on both the brake and the throttle pedal, left foot braking for most drivers. Then again make your curve in Westfield. Here, you know, you wouldn't want to put a set of wets on, you'd just destroy them. So it's one third of the racetrack that is a handful. The rest, and this is why teams are going out, they want that information. If it's going to be like this when it goes into the two qualifying segments, or when we come to Sunday's two sprint races, we'll be have to contend with these conditions as well. So tyre change at Santa Lock, and that slick's going back on by the look of it. So now it's brightening up. The feeling is that it's not wet enough for wet, but be careful with the slicks, and then the road will come back to you. And it is still grey, 
above, but we've had no more rain, which is good. So the session is, if you like, back on again. Yeah, 40 and, minutes to go. And the blue that you saw a minute ago, David, has now begun to release the rays over Paddock and Druid, which were the, and uh, down into Greymill Bend, which were the, the, the trickiest of the corners here at Brands Hatch, and that's sort of mixed and match conditions. So it is now a dry weather tire track, yeah. but caution is required in the first three corners. But at the moment, you look out into the pit lane and you think, what are they talking about? Rain? Because the sun is shining today. Everywhere looks bright, but we did have those few minutes of, of heavy rain. Anyway, uh, at the moment, Dries van Thor is the fastest in this session. 1 minute 24.066, and the car that he's been sharing with is Equal Paris Compagnon. Oh. Going straight on is the Santalot number 25 Audi. That's Simon Gachet, who has just had a lesson in how wet it is at the top of the hill. Well, there you go. First, second and third corner, I said, be careful. Maybe he's going out, maybe the tyres are not, well, they've been sitting in the garage, they're not in the heaters. Cold brakes, cold tyres, no coefficient of grip of the circuit. You know, does Einstein have to be in the car with you to tell you you're not going to slow down? <laughs> well, Gachet's learned the lesson, hopefully. Uh, we'll be error free from now on. A little scuff mark just on the leading edge of that rear wing at the bottom, or is that just part of the... Looks like something's had a little rub on it. I don't know quite what it is. This is a very, very crazy graphic on part of the wrap that these many of these cars are not painted. They've got one of these very fine films called a wrap. So if you want to change your sponsor or change your colour or for whatever reason, you get the wrap man to come in. Um, and it's not full of chili and all that stuff either. I love a Mexican wrap. <laughs> Yes, but many cars. But why is there so much leaf litter? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's spring. I mean, my oak tree, my self-planting oak tree in my garden, well, which will be my legacy, <laughs> is just barely coming into bud. Gachet through after his moment at the start of the lap, and others venturing out now. So the road's going to get busier again. Are we now going to start getting to a point where the lap times are going to come down? Not yet. No improvements in sectors just yet, though. No, you're going to need a, an outlap to, to find out what our conditions like. Then you start your first flying lap and you'll push a little bit further. I would imagine for most drivers now that they're rejoining the track, it's going to take them maybe three laps to get anywhere near to what their current best time is. Uh, you see Gil Perez compact is back into the number one car. Dries van Thor has done his run 124-04, for the young Belgian driver. So, interesting time to put Ezekiel, or to put Perez compact back into the car. Maybe I would have kept Dries van Thor in to see until the track becomes what I would call stable, settled, then you put your yeah. second driver in. Pit lane's still very, very busy, so now is a good time to be out there doing a quick lap because, relatively speaking, uh, you haven't done that much traffic to worry about. Gachet, in terms of sectors, nothing sparkling. Nobody yet has done a green sector since the rain passed through. The Audi, a new car for this year, the GT3 2019, and it is more numerous on the Rockpan GT World Challenge Europe grid than any other brand. So. As ever, lots of teams gravitating the Audi way, but we have got opposition from the likes of Lamborghini and Aston Martin and Mercedes and Ferrari. Do you think the deal has got anything to do with that? Is there a good deal that you're looking at Audi dealer <laughs> that you can tap into? You'd think so, wouldn't you? I mean, there are hordes of them, and yet in GT4 there's only one uh, on the grid. So, uh, the effort being put behind the new GT3 car, perhaps. Stefan Ortani, welcome back. He has only missed one Blanc Pan European race, and that was the Monza round at the start of this season. And he's reunited with Santalot. He's back in an Audi, which is where he was at the start of his Blanc Pan career. But he won Spa 24 hours for Porsche. He won Le Mans for Porsche. Porsche Super Cup champion. Hugely versatile driver, hugely experienced. And he may not have to the thousandth of a second the pace of some of the younger drivers anymore, but he still knows what he's doing in a race car. You know, you can't... How do you equate what experience brings to a team? Yeah. You know, everybody in a team wants to the, the, the hot rod driver, the quickest guy in a GT3 car. Great for certain contexts, but when you want somebody there to bring a car home, maybe in Spa 24, in darkness, in rain, 
difficult conditions, cold. You know, people like Ortelli, that's where they come to the fore. He's had his spell with Emil Frey racing and the Lexus had that big accident at Spa, but it's good that he's back racing. And maybe he's just a bit happier in an Audi, having spent far more seasons racing the original car. And that is pretty much what, uh, what to expect. Let's see what he can do this weekend. He wasn't terribly happy in Spa, what, two seasons ago, or three seasons ago, in the 24 hours, when he was taken out of that car. And I think his current team was put in because for some reason, Stefan just couldn't dial in at that particular point of the race. Kurt Team got into it and did a blinding job. I think it was Kurt Team. Nicky Team. Nicky Team, Sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Nicky, yeah. Yeah. You, you were up, you weren't, you weren't even there, David. You were, you were <laughs> off in the sunshine of Norfolk. <laughs> oh, it was one of those years, was it? But yes, you're right, Stefan Ortelli uh, switched out of the car in that 24-hour race, which, of course, is the centrepiece of the uh, Brock Hand GT Series in Europe, the total 24 hours of Spa at the end of July. Right, Renat Salikov you're looking at now, 333. This is another of the Pro-Am cars, and he comes over the timing line, and that lap did have uh, improvements in sectors, but the lap time was a tenth down. But now you can improve. There are better sector times being offered up. Yeah, and, and now the sun has more or less broken through over the entirety of the, the Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit. Track conditions very quickly changing, very quickly coming back to the levels they were when the session got underway, what, some 25 or 26 minutes ago. Good time, I think, to get out and see what your opt optimum time or optimum maybe prepared car settings likely to be. Sometimes when the track's been wet, going to dry, then to full dry, and the sun's on the circuit, that's often the time of the track is at its best. So Sanikov's Ferrari up towards Westfield. This is 24th overall in terms of the time, and in its class, fourth. So it's a, a pro-am car. Dries van for his time of 1 minute 24.066 from earlier on still stays, but this is, as yet, the slower session. Yeah, it's interesting, Ezekiel Perez Compact, who is actually in the car, has come back into the pit lane, having only gone out relatively recently, that in fact we're not even seeing a lap time uh, showing into the pit, so the last lap, the lap prior to coming in uh, has been deleted by his entry into the pit lane. The director seems to like this car, doesn't he? Maybe, maybe he's got a bit of a thing about the Ferrari. I know he loves Fulham and King's Road and all that stuff. <laughs> Christopher Meese has just been reported to the stewards for speeding in the pit lane. Number two Audi, the Christopher Meese. Charles Viet's car, and I don't think you've seen Charles Viet behind the wheel yet, so it must be Christopher Mies. Number 10 Audi is Oscar Twinho at the wheel, you just were looking at. He had a moment in FP1 running very, very wide up at Sheen Curve. Number 4 Mercedes, still Mario Engel, doing the lion's share of the driving in this session, and we're almost at the halfway point. So, Mario Engel, who was at one point, I think, quickest to second, because he's one of the first on the track, currently down in fifth place. But nobody, no one at all, has shown any green on our timing and scoring, which would indicate that any of the three sectors on the lap have they gone quicker in. Phil Keane has just done one of those. He's yeah, just done one of those in sector one. Yeah, just so I said it, it's popped up in yeah. sector two. And Engel is pressing on. The sector times don't suggest that, but he's certainly going nicely. Are we going to get improved lap time shortly, therefore? You say going, Mario Engel's going, but he didn't use any of the curve on the exit of Hawthorne. And let's see what he does up through Sheen Curve if he's conservative on his entry and exit. Well, it looks like, I would say, normal race pace. What's going to happen in the exit of Sterling? Will he run the curve? Just, just catch it. Maybe he's mindful of the fact that curves do take a little longer to, to clear of any moisture than the actual tarmac itself does. So Mario Engel then with slower sectors coming up, building up towards the flying lap. Over the timing line, he will now go. And that was a 1 minute 30, which is a fairly gentle lap, but he's just done a personal best in the last sector, as if to prove that this is the lap to watch. So here we go, up the hill. So this is your entry. You can just hug the curve all the way around, which is probably the most popular way of doing it, then drop down into Graham Hill Bend. Again, nice. Apex then runs, well, that, how wide you run is going to be a down to the stewards. Fastest overall, sector one, gets the nose of the car in 
on the entry to Surtees again, floats the car out, just picks up the curve in the exit. From here on down, you've got a moment to draw breath and think about how am I going to challenge Hawthorne's corner because this is the next corner I've got to attack. And you want to attack it because you can carry more speed into it and through it than you sometimes imagine. Absolute best in sector one, looking good. No traffic ahead either. Sector two will only come at the end of Sterling's. So into Sheen takes a normal, pretty average. Looks good, nothing about it. Dramatic, fastest sector. Sector two, just actually before the entry into Sterling's bend. So complete the lap, keep it neat and tidy. A second, almost a second up. So last lap they did, well, the fastest at 24-0. So that's almost a second up. Barrow Engel is going to go into the 23s on this lap. But how much of the 23s we wait to see? So 22, 22, 9, 3, 0. Brilliant lap. Fastest lap of the day. Yeah, and the perfect lap because that was absolute best in all three sectors. He tied that to perfection because the only time he came across the car was at the end of the lap going into paddock, by which stage he'd done the job. One minute, 22.9. He had been in the pits. He'd been in the pits for some seven minutes. Came out, did, well, in the pits for five and a half minutes. Came out, did the side lap, but onto a flying lap. I think that's a fresh set of tyres on that number four Mercedes because you don't just suddenly find over a second per lap having sat in the pitch for five and a half minutes. Great effort. Thomas Neubauer, 89 Mercedes, far less experienced, 17 fastest. What can he do? Thomas Neubauer, uh, one of those in the Silver Cup. That's an Acura ASP Mercedes as against Black Falcon that runs the fastest car in the session. We talked about the battle between the Lamborghini teams. You've got the same at Mercedes with Acura ASP, which won most titles last year in Europe, uh, and Black Falcon, which won the other one. So it's going to be interesting to see how that feud comes out at the end of this year. So Noe Bart coming down, and uh, currently... It's a Swiss gamble, isn't it? No, that's not a big one. No, Noe Bart, 17th fastest. Yeah, I mean, seven, sorry, it's 17th. Yeah, not improving in sensors. Oh. But the lap time was better, yeah. conversely. Christopher Meese has made an improvement up to fourth place on the run 24.3, but that's 1.4 seconds slower than Barrow Engel, which well, I think when he goes to confirm what my feeling is that Engel has got a, a run on a much better, if not a new set of tyres, while everybody else around would appear to be running on the tyres that they started this session on. So we're into the second half of the session. There is 563, which was brought in by Andrea Caldarelli. And the lollipop removed for the car to go back out now. Caldarelli sharing uh, with Marco Mappelli. It's a good combination of drivers. I, mean, a, I tell you what, the, the team really, really, really impressed, I felt, that Monza in the three-hour event. And the fact that Andrea Caldarelli, among his many other responsibilities, is effectively the, the team manager. I mean, how does it allow him any time... He's a racing driver and... I mean, what does he do when he goes to bed at night? Does he go to bed as a racing driver or does he go to bed as a, a team manager or team principal or whatever it is? He's thinking about his driving, he's thinking about the team, he's thinking about the other cars, he's thinking about the next round. It must be very difficult to keep all those balls in the air. Well, I mean, I mean, he's juggling two at the minute, so, I mean, how many more could you juggle? That's what I've read over the timing line, and the lap that he has just done is a 34. That was a gentle lap. I think this is going to be the one. If you follow the Mauro Engel pattern, he's done his start up that. Now, Vincent Abril, he's going to go for it. Yes. If you, you need, obviously, that first out lap is a little bit of an extraordinary lap, but once you come through clearways, far curved clearways, you will know whether the car is going to be with you, whether you can stand on it or whether you're going to have to do maybe one more lap to try and bring the tower up. That personal best. Uh, I was four tenths of a second up on this personal best. Uh, I'll need to see what he's going to do by the second sector to see whether that's going to bring that car up to anywhere near currently in 12th position, 124.995. He needs to find basically two seconds. Yeah. To find a second and a half on that second and third sector is a very big ask indeed, and I would suggest that it's not going to happen. He could certainly have it by finding a second and bring himself up into the, the middle of the top ten. But Engel knows the Mercedes inside out, whereas Avril, of course, is having to learn about this car. Yes, I know he's a, a pro driver and, and he'll be able to adapt, but he doesn't have the depth of knowledge of the Mercedes and its quirks and its nuances that Engel will have. No, and I think that the, the Black Falcon entry 
it's one of those entries that kind of sort of flies under the radar sometimes, whereas the 88, the Aka ASP, particularly with the Flatelli Marcello, they go second quicker, even better. Indeed, good effort. So he's eight tenths of a second, picked up time in that last sector, a massive amount, almost a second, eight tenths of a second. To bounce out in a build, as the lap progressed, the car got quicker and quicker. Is there another lap in that set of tyres, and also does the traffic for me, but eight tenths is still quite a margin. Yeah, but that's the difference between having grip and not having grip, and talking about not having grip, that's an example of, and that isn't bounce in the build, by the way, in the 87. No, that's Jean-Luc Bogoli. Yes. And he's all around here, he trying to get out the way of the Audi, but yeah. very nearly off the road again, Bobalik, as he recovers. Yeah, slightly uh, wandering around as he came down the hill. He should have been maybe more aware that there was quicker traffic following him. And uh, let's watch again and see, as you come up the hill, hit the brakes, you can see the nose dipping, and it just doesn't really slow down. Now, whether that's braked a little bit on the late side or just wasn't confident enough to hit the brake really, really hard, to get that thing to slow down even quicker, and consequently ended up at no man's land almost off the track. Merkel caught a lot, he's gone second quickest. Half a second now behind Mauro Engel. So, fastest sector, sector three. Again, fastest sector times for some of these driver car combinations coming at the end of the lap rather than being able to sustain it all the way through. Got Ezekiel Perez compact number one. Back behind the wheel of that car, you also saw Nick Foster a moment ago, the Australian, in one of the attempt to run Audis. Martin Ucker's team, and we have got just under 25 minutes of the session to go. So, Engel, Portolotti, Abril is the top three. That Adrice Van Core time is if you look Paris Compact back into the pit lane. He's not doing many laps, he doesn't feel. No, he didn't, and his last lap was at 127.3, which is you know, a lap of little consequence. 63 Lamborghini, Mirko Bottolotti continuing, and uh, he had fast, a personal best in sector one, slow sector two, so maybe uh, they had traffic or he didn't quite get the bit between one and two hooked up, so will he continue and push for another lap, which is what he's choosing to do. Marco Bottolotti over the timing line, Christopher Mies has just gone second. And Portolotti's lap was slower, 126.018. So it's Mercedes, Audi, Lamborghini in the top three. Now we need one of the Astons to get up there, and the best or better of the two Astons is eight, Marvin Kirchhofer. And only a thousandth of a second between Christopher Mies yes. in second and Mirko Portolotti, who had been second, who's now dropped down to third. He's got a little bit of traffic ahead of him. So that'll, as he would be going into Sterling, so he's got clear of it, so we can see from the commentary booth. So good assist for Mirko Bortolotti to be able to continue along. Personal, no, it's not a personal, but Christopher Meese, personal best, pushing yet again, but he needs to find that half a second yeah. to get anywhere near the rear of the number four Mercedes. Now, speaking of Aston Martins, that's 62, which currently is only 22nd. This is Hugo de Sadelier at the wheel of it, who has gone very well in uh, sports cars, in LMP2 and LMP3 type sports cars. Now, switching to GT but uh, he was second in his class in the ELMS two years ago with United Auto Sports. And the Sadler, his dad, Stanislas, the Sadler, used to race GT cars in the 80s and 90s, comes up towards the timing line now. Let's see whether that's going to be an improvement. It's a 28.7. It is not an improvement, therefore. It does look... I mean, it, it, it's, it's a very, very... It looks like a proper racing car, the Aston, I'm talking about. Yeah, so it's something that It's yeah. just that it's really squat, and then the back of the car, you can see the way that all the aerodynamics have been very much built into the design of the car. It wasn't just done by some airy-fairy stylist, you know, back at uh, wherever the Aston Martin, New, Newport Pagnell. There's been a bit of thoughts gone into this because yeah. they know this car is going to be used in GT3 or GT, but not maybe in GT4. Is this a GT4 or is it the... No, GT3. GT3. Yeah. Yeah. Through it comes. They are motorsport colours. Stealth grey almost in the blue. And up towards oh. Germany. And that weather oh. does not look good. Oh my god, that's behind us. And that ever. That's, that's, like, that's, a, that's a tsunami of a car. Absolutely, that's coming. That's coming. Right, is it getting strike within 22 minutes? We might have to delay going for lunch, you know. It's going to be very wet out. Oh, well, don't spoil my day, yeah. <laughs> 
but it is looking ever gloomier out there. And the teams are looking oh. at this and thinking, please don't deposit that cloud concept all over us. The Sadler up towards the line, but if it is going to start pouring it down, we've had the best of the time. The Sadler goes through, gets himself up past the Santa Lock Audi, which has got Neil Stephenhouse at the wheel. Headlights are on. Uh, I don't know if that requirement was ever rescinded. It was certainly an instruction at the start of the session. Headlights must be on, but all of a sudden, with that little bit of darkness again falling across paddock and up into Druids, and you can see coming down through Great Hill Bend. But Lucas Stoltz into the car, the quickest car overall, trying to get in a lap maybe before we have to go to a full wet racetrack. So quite a few heading for the pit lane. We've had another improvement from the Aston of Marvin Kirkhofer, which is now seventh fastest. We've also had an improvement from Andrea Bertolini, and Hugo de Sadovia's next lap was a quicker one, a 125.346. Wolfgang Triller is the only Am Cup entrant with Florian Schultz as his co-driver. He also is improving. So, oh, Lucas Stoltz, this is his first sector time, 26.6 which is the ballpark figure with Christopher Meast at virtually identical time. Number so, one Audi is back out with Dries Van Thor at the wheel, and he has just done a personal best in the first sector. Stoltz comes through, let's have a look and see, he's got traffic, so that may have a bearing on his exit out of clear ways, comes across top of his line, gets maybe a small amount of a, well, of a lap, 124.6, which probably under the circumstances he would be happy enough with. It's so. the pit lane that comes the Lamborghini, Andrea Calderelli, that is. Still behind the wheel, and the dark clouds still loom over the pit lane. You know, the, the worst thing that could happen is that that just opens up and we're making our way down to the, the, the lunch canteen. Oh, no. Have you got an umbrella? I've got a hat. But I've got an umbrella. Oh, okay. Now Dries Van Thor last time improved 123.576. Matthew Drudy in the Attempto Audi 56 improved 125.047, and also an improvement last time came yet again from Andrea Bertolini. So the improvements are coming, but the fun might be spoiled by the weather again here. Yeah, I mean if this is you know rolling the dice a little bit. You, if you want to get both, particularly in the pro category, which is where the, these teams are now focusing upon, is to get your pro drivers into the car in drag track conditions. And they're all looking skyward as well. They're wondering whether this rain will actually, for the second time in the session, have a bearing on the running of it. Uh, so let's get both yeah. drivers in, give them both dry track running time. And then if it rains, we'll have to adjust. If it doesn't rain, well, nothing lost. The wind has certainly picked up, because just looking at the flags fluttering on top of the race control building opposite us, those flags look like they're not long for this world, and it's getting very, very blustery. It's got all darker. Um, Put the lights on inside, we can't see anything. Exactly. Uh, I do fear this rain is coming, but is it going to hit within 18 minutes of the session? So, hustling on. Well, that's on the windscreen now. Yeah. Is that maybe just is that real grime rather than rain? Dries Van Thor, you were with. Still 18 minutes and counting for the session to go. Rain on the camera lens in the pit lane. So this might be the last lap that anybody who is on track and that is raining yet again. So anybody on a lap can complete it, but anybody going on to a lap will need to be cautious. The track will be different to the last visit they made through Paddock Hill Bend. They've all backed out of it. Be careful under brakes. Everybody's sort of tippy-toeing around. So the road is still greasy ah, and here's further ah, proof. Ah, that's not perfect. And that's how didn't they oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh. And he's gonna need assistance, I would have thought. Well bounces off the Rexy cell barrier, keeps going, keep digging. I, I know Aston Martin is making a SUV four-wheel drive. Is this the prototype? <laughs> to drive onto the gravel like that, a two-wheel drive with that level of ground clearance. And there we go, there we are. There's your rain. Uh, hail, possibly, rather than rain. I was being charitable, um, seeing that it was meant to be late spring. And <laughs> Stein shot horse and Nick Foster thinking about the conditions, thinking, what is this? 
and the teams would rather like to be back in the garage as well. So that car has just been brought in by Nick Foster. I do like the revised nose styling on the, these 2019 interpretations for Audi. Um, it's just a lot more modern. The, 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 the very traditional Audi grille has sort of somewhat been calmed down yeah, here. Are. And uh, wisely, wisely, they're going to decide to push that back into the garage. Oh! That's Bobley. I was going to say. That's no, not, no, it's not. no, it's not, Marvin. It's, G it's Jim Clark, <laughs> uh, who's taken over from Bobo and has had a right moment going through 30s. It's the Bobo car that we've missed the driver change for, so Jim yeah, Clark. I mean, look, you can see it's coming in horizontal. Yeah, blimey. I mean, it'll be snowballs you know, at, uh, what time is it? 1.15. So most are in the pits. Isn't and if this they're a, not, they need to be. Isn't this a bank holiday weekend? Yeah, that'll be why. No surprise. Story as well, no but, surprise. Yeah. I mean, there it is. It's you know, Northern Europe has been affected by you know, unseasonable weather, and Brands is getting its moment in the in the hail as well. well. Those spectators that thought they were in for a nice spring day are ruining their choice of clothing at the well, moment. Well, I, all I can say, I've got respect for them. They're standing out there. They've brought their weather, wet weather gear as well as their dry weather gear, and they're having to wear probably both to stay warm. So back again, is it going to be a wet weather tyre run for everybody to further discover what brands, what the joys of brands in these conditions are going to offer up? It, it, it comes in in a squall, then it mm. sort of blows itself out before it really becomes a major problem. Yeah, the wind is very, very strong at the moment, certainly on the pit straight where we are. Elsewhere around the circuit, there are ways of keeping warm. Now, who's shading or sheltering who there, would you say? I think the lady's sheltering the man. It might be right. It looks like it. Mm. Yeah, it's coming from her, you know, blowing into her back. Is this the conversation that says, um, I really thought we should have gone to Blue Water shopping today rather than standing in the rain, or is this a declaration of undying love because she's having such a great time? Anyway, um, the teams are not having a great time, and the drivers aren't because they're losing the track time. Uh, but they do go out, they've got treacherous track conditions to cope with. So we've got 14 minutes and change on the clock. The session is live, but as yet there are no takers. And the rain or the hail or whatever it is, is now beginning to fall in a more vertical nature than the horizontal one that it was initially. So I suspect that there's not going to be an awful lot of action until the track gets thoroughly wet. Yes, it's looking fairly grim out of the Grand Prix. It loop, is, yeah. Where that hardy fan is. Yeah. But we need the track to actually glisten or yeah. sheen um, when it's, it's still at the phase where it, we're, we're just about at the level where you'll be starting to get rooster tails or spray okay. coming up. Then that's when the wet weather tyre then does its job. We saw in Monza when people in the final stint at Monza in the three hours were caught between, it was not quite good enough for slicks and it wasn't actually ideal for wets and they just overheated their wets. So there's the race control building. That's what the teams are, by necessity, putting onto the cars. The Pirelli wets. Andrea Bertadini may give way to Louis Machiels now for the remainder of the session. And the marshals, all volunteers, of course, hardy souls, are standing on their posts because cars are going back out onto the circuit. Now let's see whether people tiptoe around or whether we get any dramas coming out of this. But it is Charles Hirt who is the one sent out first. Well, oh, what's that? Is that a blue screen or is that the blue sky? Ah, must be a blue screen. Can't ah, be blue sky, sure. Oh, it is, David. <laughs> <laughs> On a bank holiday weekend. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just the weather pattern that's just coming in and out, squalls coming in and out. So, on wet weather tyres for the Audi, number two. So, tippy toe around just to see where the grip levels are. Of course, the wet weather tyre, totally different compound and design of tyres with the dry weather slick. But there are rooster tails coming from the rear of the Audi, so it is properly wet, certainly wet enough to allow the wet weather tyre to operate in its proper window, 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 window. And uh, evidence of just how much rain has fallen. Moving into the amount that's settling on the ground. As 12 minutes of the session to go, most have gone back out, not all, but I think you're going to find a fair few don't go back out because there's no real point risking anything. There's no point risking anything, but again, the reason you have to go out is to do, I call it homework, Yeah. just to see. You know, obviously you're not going to improve on your times, but you just want the information because, going back to what I said earlier, 
qualifying sessions could be run in identical conditions. Either event tomorrow in identical conditions. So you don't want to be starting any of those runs yeah. in well, I would call a blind uh, contact. You haven't got that information. Go, 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 but there go, go, it is. Yeah, it. Charlie, Charlie, Bert, the prime, the black stuff you should be on, not the prime stuff. So that's pretty much what Vervich did uh, when he was out tiptoeing around earlier on. Except we think this is on wax now, this car. So Charles here goes over the line. I tell you, if he's on slicks, he's a brave boy. And the way he's tippy toeing, you know, I wonder. I wonder. There's an argument, is there, to say it's more useful putting the car out on the slicks in this weather because then you get an idea of how hard you can push and whether you risk a tyre change rather than just doing the boring, sensible, safe option of going onto wet straight away. You know, and I think these are slicks. You've got the yellow yeah. markings on the tyre. I think these are slicks that the idea is on. Again, it's, a, it's information gathering, but you have to be so careful and it's so easy to get caught out. You saw just one minute ago coming out, one lap ago coming into Cloud curve and clearways. That's what he Run, did. That's the repeat. This is the uh, repeat of what he did. Yeah. So there's just no coefficient of grip between the tarmac and the, and the rubber. Almost enough water there to cause a little bit of aqua painting on top of the fact that it's, it's stone cold track and uh, on a set of slicks. It's almost like being a spa, this, isn't it? Because we know about changeable weather there, and if you can stay out on slicks with rain and, and not waste the time with another pit stop, then you get, uh, obviously, into a, a better position. David, if there's a spa, you'd be ranting on about all these trappers' beers. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. Uh, did I mention it's my birthday next week? You did, <laughs> you did, you did. Uh, treble three, Renat Salikov then, up towards the end of the lap. Uh, sorry, Renat Salikov's car, David Perel, the South African, has taken it over. The rain is still falling, certainly out of the Grand Prix loop. Where we are on the Indy circuit, it's not looking quite so bad. I mean, anybody who has been brave and gone out just to find out just how much they can run in these conditions on slick tyres isn't going to stay out, I think, take them much longer, because the rain that we're seeing here, and again, the 333 running up, now going the long, long way around, which is what is the normal line when the conditions are as they are, there's more grip out of the dirty part of the racetrack, even on wet weather tyres, but certainly on slicks, than there is on the racing line, which becomes the line where you get rubber build-up and possibly other contaminants as well. 76, Marvin Kirchhofer's car. Is it going to be Marvin that goes back out, or will Ricky Collard get a chance? Bear in mind that Kirchhofer was the one that put it off through the gravel. So let's see, it is still shown as Kirchhofer, and as the car gets to pit out, Collard is confirmed as being the man behind the wheel. Is Ricky standing on a box for that photograph, <laughs> or is that just... <laughs> Or is it small but perfectly full? Yeah. Right, eight and a half minutes to go. We know the times aren't going to come down. This now is just about survival, isn't it? Who's this getting into strife? This is... Use the eel. Yeah. So it turns into... It's again a Clark curve. Rounds yep. out a road. Off he goes. That's called riding along with the crest of a slump. <laughs> Indeed. Red flag is being shown because off the road now, look, has gone Fred Verviche. And although he's getting it back on, a red flag has been called for. Now, is there something else that we haven't seen? Or was that car just in an area, or no, was it just... There's, there's one at Clark Curve in the tyre barrier. We've not seen I it did, in the pictures, no, no, but out of our window, I did, I did see a car yeah. in the gravel at Clark Curve, and it's brought the, the tyre barriers down. The session is not going to be restarted, because it will take so long for the barriers to be repaired. I'm trying to work out who it is. That's an idea, I think. Might be right. But there's a lot of ideas, so it's a good guess. Number one, it's, that's, oh my it's God. compact, so we saw him running wide, and that's the end that's of the exactly. incident. That's so we saw him going off, but we didn't see yeah. the conclusion. Yeah, so he's got so, into the barriers. Well, that's not going to go down terribly well in the WRT team. Now, was he on slicks, which it looked like he was? So the team are going to say, you know, you're on slicks, you know, you know. Yeah, it's all part of it, but no, like you say, gather the data, now you know where you can and can't push and what the car feels like. Oh, we're sitting up here, we're armchair quarterbacks. We can sit and you know, be witty or stupid or whatever. We are not in the cockpit, we're not behind the wheel, we're not in control. Sure. In this case, unfortunately, the number one ID didn't stay in control. These are the most demanding, difficult situations for everybody, 
you. The track isn't fully wet, but it's not dry enough to run slicks, and it's the, it's the lack of temperature. So, at the end of a very odd session, it is the Mauro Engel Black Falcon Mercedes that is the fastest, 122.930. In the end, nearly half a second up on the time set by Christopher Meese in number two. Mirko Bortolotti, third fastest ahead of Dries Van Thor in the car that's gone off the road and brought out this red flag. Fifth, uh, the Vincent Abril Mercedes. Not sure that Raffaele Marchiello ever actually got behind the wheel of that car. Marvin Kirchhoff a sixth ahead of Andrea Calvarelli. A uh, good effort by Matthew Drudy to go eighth ahead of Nico Bastian and then the Shea Davis, Tom Gamble, Audi rounding out the top ten. Nick Foster 11th, Simon Gachet 12th. Christopher Hauser has done precious little driving today through circumstance. Uh, lower down the order, slowest Jean-Luc Bobelic in the car that he and Jim Plough have had a few dramas with. Florian Schultz are just ahead the Seoul and Cup entrant alongside Wolfgang Triller and David Perel sharing with Renat Salikov. 24th behind the Stefan Ortelli, Neil Stevenart Audi. And of course, after all the drama caused by the weather, now the sun has come out, but we'll have a look back at the highlights of the session. They began a fraction later uh, with the necessity to sweep up cars from the previous race. But eventually, when we got underway, everybody went out onto the circuits in the sunshine. But it wasn't long before it got chilly and very blustery and very wet as the first of the two showers uh, hit the circuit. And that gave the teams a bit of a quandary as to exactly what to do. Even before that, we had the likes of Marcus Winkelhock running wide and off the road. That was coming out of Sterling's. And on board the Lamborghini, Andrea Calderelli pressing on as well. Straight out of the pit lane and straight almost into the gravel, Simon Gachet. But he just got away with it as working his way through the traffic was the uh, 88 Mercedes Vincent Abril behind the wheel of it. Renat Salikov's Ferrari was looking quick early on as well. But then as the rain started to loom, Brands Hatch Corn Prix circuit became ever more challenging. Mirko Bortolotti watched on as Marvin Kirchhoff uh, had a moment coming into Sterling's, went through the gravel, bounced off the rectus cell barriers and back on again. Then Jim Pla had a very wayward moment going into Surtees. And it wasn't long after that that we then had Ezekiel Perez compact in the gravel, red flag session not restarted. Qualifying will be coming up next then for these cars. We'll join you for that later on this afternoon. But for now, from John Watson and David Addison, goodbye.